My name is Lori, and I am with the TheraPlay family of companies, and I am pretty much responsible for community outreach and education. So that's why I'm here tonight, kind of hosting our webinar, which we, we got a great response from. So we're really glad about that. And we're very excited because we have some experts here that are going to really be able to uh, give you some really solid advice if you have any have any little guys that are getting ready for kindergarten. So um, I'm going to introduce all of our experts here, but I also did not want to go without um, introducing our MC, who is Jason. And uh, you will hear him popping in. If you have questions, please um, feel free to put them in the comments in the chat session. And um, he is also going to be um, distributing after this event a really great packet of um, all kinds of cool things for you to be able to do with your pre-kindergartner to help get them ready. And uh, hi, folks, this is Jason. We actually got our first question and somebody asked if we'll be recording this. And yes, of course we will. And we'll be posting it on our social media. Yeah, and we will follow up with everyone afterwards, like I said, with, with all the great information. And, um, and then feel free. We really are interested in providing information to you that is needed and bringing experts together to be able to, um, to give you whatever you need to help you with, um, with raising your children. So with, with that, I'm gonna, um, and I'm going through, I'm looking at um, the Zoom call. So kind of like the Brady Bunch, I'm, I'm dating myself here for those of you who know who the Brady Bunch is. Um, gonna start um, over to um, my left and introduce Melody. And Melody is actually, I'm um, with the, TheraPlay family of companies, Melody is as well, specifically with a company by the name of AOT in the western part of our state that is really focused on educational services, but she is um, an occupational therapist, and she has always had a passion uh, to work with children and to help children and has been doing that um, since the 90s, right, Melody? Not that the 30 years. 30 years. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we all go back to that. And she's actually an educational uh, manager with our organization. Um, also early intervention provider. So we're going to talk a little bit more um, when we get further into our discussions about how you can access the various services, um, depending on the age of your child. Um, and she's provided clinical supervision for all of AOT's clinical fieldwork program for many years. Um, she's got a postgraduate cert cert certification in neurodevelopmental treatment and therapeutic listening. Um, so we're really excited to have Melody on our call. And then in the bottom two quadrants of our screen, we have Jen Clark and Melissa Perez. And very excited because Jen is actually the owner of a preschool that we work very closely with um, that is right across the street from our Middletown, Delaware Outpatient Center. Um, founded it in 2007. She's a full-time working mom of three boys and really recognizes the need for quality childcare and educational programs. Melissa is the director of Brilliant Little Minds. Um, and she's been working in early childhood education for 21 years and currently oversees there's, you have six locations, Jen, right? So, um, and, and their child care program starts at infancy and goes through pre-K and they also have um, before and after care services, summer camps and virtual hybrid as we are all navigating this past year and a half with COVID, hybrid virtual learning for kids in kindergarten um, up to the age of six. I know um, I've worked with Jen and Melissa and had, was really just struck by their passion when we started working together to really um, help all of the children in their preschools and, and especially the ones that are struggling get whatever they need. So we, we're really excited that they could um, dedicate their time tonight to being with us as well. So um, 
I think that's all I have for um, introduction. So, and just for those of you that, that don't know, Jason is actually um, incognito under a Lauren Toolin <laughs> sign-in, who is our director of our marketing services. So Jason, if you wanna pull up the presentation and we can get started. And please, the more questions you have, the better. We want this to be as beneficial for all of you that are attending. <coughs> <clears throat> I think we already did the welcome, so yeah. All right, so I guess I'm up. <laughs> so I, I am extremely happy to be here. Kindergarten is one of my favorite age levels to work with. I, I enjoy working with kids basically birth to uh, kindergarten are my favorite group of kids. Um, so first of all, I, I wanted to go over a little bit about just some general develop, developmental milestones that would be expected for kindergarten age children, both from a, excuse me, <clears throat> a fine motor and a visual motor um, perspective. And they go so closely together, fine and visual motor, when you're um, looking at, you know, school readiness skills. So um, I'll try to just go over them pretty quickly. I know you're going to get some information um, after. So from, I'm sure you guys hear a lot about grasp and what, there's a, definitely a progression of how grasp would happen. But um, by the time kids start to enter into preschool, you know, about four years old, and then into um, starting into kindergarten, they should have a mature grasp. So, which typically means, um, and I'll try to hold this up so you can see it a little bit better. So, typically means holding it with your thumb and your index finger and your three fingers up against the palm of your hand, if that helps. Um, so, that tends to happen about four to five years of age. When you're looking at what they should be able to do with their hands. They should be able to manipulate objects, put them in different size containers, stack objects. Um, and of course, um, when you talk about kindergarten, you're talking about scissors. So um, you want that two-handed coordination in order to use scissors, and you wanna be able to um, position the scissors in your hand. Um, <coughs> excuse me, snip paper, snip along the edge, snip across paper if that um, does help make sense. And eventually in kindergarten, you're gonna be able to cut along the line, cut out some simple shapes, all for um, the learning activities that they all do in kindergarten. And I just love scissors. I know it's so silly, but I think cutting activities and gluing, it's just such a great activity. And I'm sure Melissa uses it a lot with teaching all kinds of academic skills as well. Um, cutting and pasting, you know, letters and alphabet and all that. Lots of kindergarten teachers use that. Melody, yeah. I just have a quick question with scissors. So I had a lefty and it was always uh, a lot more difficult for him because it seemed like all the scissors were made for righties. Mm -hmm. Do you have a suggestion if we have any families that do have like left-handed kids? And I mean, the, the, the best thing is, is to buy left-handed scissors and you just have to look for them. Um, of course, uh, Amazon is our friend when it comes to that. The, the difficulty with using right-handed scissors in your left hand is that the blade covers the line. Like if, I don't know, I'm sure you can't see this, but um, that's the difference is the position of the blade on the side. So it, it seems like a very small and significant thing, but, um, and then you teach them just like you would, you know, kids who are right-handed. And I think sometimes people may be familiar with lefties. They tend to kind of hook their hands around like this. And sometimes they write upside down and, it's just all about positioning your paper. Um, you know, when you write right-handed, you slant your paper to the left. When you write left-handed, you should be slanting your paper to the right, if that makes sense. Um, and the same with scissors. You know, you don't want your arm out here when you're cutting with your right hand. So it's always about really positioning both hands and getting that stability in your shoulders and your elbows close to you. But um, I've, I've been lucky with finding, yeah, because if you get safety scissors that are right-handed and you try to have them cut left-handed, they never cut left-handed. Um, so my, my, if you really have somebody who's left-handed, I would, you know, spend the money to uh, go into left-handed scissors. 
Thank you. You're welcome. That a few 20 years ago. <laughs> Well, I know my my I have a family member, my brother is left handed, he's the only one out of everybody. And so he, we always have to make sure we seat him appropriately at the dinner table. <laughs> um, but in regards to visual motor, so the biggest thing that kids start to learn in um, kindergarten are letters right now, typically some preschools do teach letters, some don't, it all kind of depends on their curriculum. and how closely they work with their preschools. I think Melissa and I talked about that a little bit. Some, some preschools focus more, some don't. So, um, and then as they progress to kindergarten, it's about writing on the lines or writing between the lines and you know getting smaller and getting better control. So when you're looking at visual motor skills, you're looking at, um, you know, do they start to imitate shapes and lines? And then that moves to copying shapes and lines. And then you start with tracing letters and copying letters. Um, I hope that all, I didn't talk too fast. <laughs> you know, and I know we've seen some children like where they're struggling in this area, especially like with spatial awareness where either like they have a whole line to write letters on and they squinch everything up, you know, to mm -hmm. a quarter of the line or maybe they have no concept of where the line is even. And oh, yeah, that might are, just flow all over the page. Yeah, my, my simplest, uh, I'm very low tech when it comes to adaptations for kids. And sometimes the simplest thing for that I've found that works for kids is drawing a box, you know, drawing a rectangle. So if, you know, if they're writing really, really big, you try to bring them down a little bit, do you draw like eight, two inch box. If they're, um, you know, if they're writing really, really tiny, although I have to admit, I don't usually get that problem. Um, it tends to be the big size, right, Melissa? Like they get really large and you're trying to bring them down. And so giving them a, a nice bright border, either with, you know, a nice Sharpie marker or, um, or a highlighter. Kids love all that fun stuff, you know, highlighters and Sharpies. And that helps give them that visual border um, sometimes you need a physical border with wiki sticks or rulers or things like that, but I found that the simple box seems to work the best. Uh, any, any questions about visual motor skills? Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> well, um, Next, I did want to talk a little bit about self-help skills. Again, this is something that I find that we're trying to promote independence in kindergarten. And um, so sometimes it's about starting at home helps a lot. And I know as a, as a mom as well, that when you're trying to get out the door, right? How do you practice getting their coat on and off? You know, So maybe when you get home, it's a good opportunity to practice that. Um, but I have to say kindergarten teachers are phenomenal when it comes to practice, preschool teachers as well. I, I think they're so, work so hard to get the children independent so that they can, um, you know, do the routine. It's all about the classroom routine, right? And following the routine. And um, as you see about like washing and drying your hands, a lot of schools have like step-by-step -step little pictures to help the kids know what step to go, you know, from step one to step three. Um, talking about dressing, like I mentioned, about taking off, being able to take off their coat, be able to put it on. Taking off always comes first. Um, put on, working on using zippers and buttons. And I know that um, in the summer, we don't always practice that because we don't have coats. I don't know about how it is over there in the east, but um, the weather over here has been really goofy. It's either 90 degrees or it's 60. It's been <laughs> really strange. So. Um, you know, again, like practicing, <clears throat> even just unzipping, again, like unzipping comes before zipping and um, getting those little tabs together is really hard, but um, it's something that kids really love to do. They get so proud when they can be independent with some of their self-help skills. Um, and then after zippers comes, you know, comes buttons and then down the line, you know, belts and snaps, that's all kind of tricky. Um, and then there's always that shoe tying. Yeah. 
Yes, shoe tying, let me tell you, is first grade, okay? So don't stress yourself out. That's with shoe a good tying. point. <laughs> shoe tying is, is very much a challenge. And, and when I see somebody rate, I'm like, nope, nope, we're not doing shoe tying in kindergarten. They've got too much other stuff to learn. <laughs> you know, we can stick with Velcro in kindergarten and then go to the, the tied sneakers. Right. Exactly. And, um, and, and a lot of uh, OTs I work with when we do teach shoe tying, just to let you know, we do teach the double knot too. You want to make sure they stay tied because I think after kindergarten teachers kind of get tired of tying shoes, but I think that's their second job sometimes. Um, so just um, a little bit about, um, <clears throat> excuse me, about gross motor progression. Again, the developmental progression is um, you know when you're in school some of the things that they have to learn is you know how they get from classroom A to classroom B you know even kindergartners do transition a little bit you know to the bathroom back from the bathroom you know to their specials and back and so um, it's all about keeping up and traveling through the school um, going to lunch being able to hold your tray and get through the line those kinds of things so um, a lot of times we talk about that we call that um, you know, functional mobility and being able to, you know, get from within the home to the classroom, um, walking with peers throughout the school, like I said, and of course being safe while you're walking through the classroom setting um, and walking around the classroom without bumping into people. Um, and then again, some talking about balance skills that um, some school districts, some school buildings have stairs, some school buildings do not have stairs, um, but for stairs, a lot of times what is um, appropriately sized stairs for adults are not appropriately sized stairs for kindergartners. So um, if you see children walking, you know, in a school building setting, a lot of times they're holding onto the railing, walking two feet per step, but that has a lot to do with the size of the stairs. But um, basically they go from, you know, walking up the steps and holding on to hands and the handrail with two feet per step, which is taking, you know, two feet per step and then walking up and down, just using one foot per step and then walking up and down using one foot per step and just one handrail. Um, being able to um, balance throughout, um, balancing too is also about being able to climb off and on a playground equipment. I know a lot of our therapists work with um, the teachers at recess time to make sure the kids can be safe, accessing all the playground equipment, being able to go up and down the slide safely or off and on the swings, things like that. And then also gross motor um, manipulative skills for school age children for kindergartners tend to be, you know, ball skills, throwing, catching, um, kicking the ball. Um, they play a lot of games in kindergarten with kids so that they learn the rules um, and be able to take turns, those kinds of things that are really important for um, all students to learn. <clears throat> and Melissa, were you gonna speak to this a little bit? Oh, we can't hear you, Melissa. Oh. No. Can you guys hear me? Yes, yeah. we can hear you now. Okay. Yes. All right. I was like, mm, it's all the way up. I just kept pressing the button. So yeah, I'll jump in. Um, Melody, thank you. And I'm going to just kind of touch some same things and how, how uh, she brought up some things when it comes to fine motor and gross motor. Um, she brought up some good examples of tools and things that we can use with, with some of these areas. Um, but one of the main things can, when it comes to kindergarten, getting ready, just making sure you're you know ready to start school is the teachers are really big on social and emotional development. Um, and when it comes to you know regulating your emotions, it's pretty much, are you able to manage your feelings um, are you able to follow um, expectations that they have set for you guys? So it's nothing that's um, too too demanding, but it's just you know the simple things are, that you're able to do um, within the classroom, within interacting with, with with you with parents and friends and things like that. Um, with language, um, it's pretty. Um, we're missing. 
I think with physical is out the way. Okay, so with language, um, it's pretty much, are you able to um, follow directions, simple directions, one, two steps? Um, are you comprehending some of the language that, that, the, that we are asking? A lot of us, we don't realize, including myself, um, I will talk way too fast and not, not knowing that I have said some things way too quickly for some of our friends to understand what we're actually asking of them. Um, and then I guess Wendy has an example. Could you give some examples? Examples as, to, as in, is in social emotional or cognitive? Or language, social emotional. Yeah, so like, okay, so with social emotional, I guess when it comes with like feelings are when it comes like to the classroom, like for us in a, in a preschool classroom or three-year-old classroom here for us, um, when it comes to seeing certain things if a child's crying or a child wants something, just depending on how things are happening, are you to express you know, what happened? What, do you need something? What is it that you need? Do you need help with this? Or are you able to, you know, do what we're asking? Are you able to, you know, cut out like how she brought early with scissors? Do you need help? Do you need help with cutting the scissors? Do you know, um, with gluing and where it goes back to? Um, so simple things like that. Yeah. And I would say too, like some of the other things that we see, and, and I would also like to preface it with, uh, again, this past year and a half with COVID, we've seen more children struggling because of the change in, in routine um, with what they're used to and not having exposure to play dates, preschool, uh, you know, some of those things, depending, you know, it's been all different kinds of versions, but, you know, are the, you know, are the kids like melting down? consistently, unexpectedly? Um, are they able to adapt to a change in the environment? Um, we yeah, Absolutely. Like, even when it yeah. comes like, to the classroom, are you able to, um, you know, when it comes to sharing certain things in the classroom? A lot of the yeah, time. that's a... So, that's, um, and being able to do that's not always, you know, an easy task to do for some of us. Right, right, and 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 we, uh, and I know Melody will attest to this from you know our occupational therapist. We do see like sometimes there's some sensory challenges either uh, where you know avoidance or needing some sensory input that really can impact this as well. Right, um, definitely, and it's to come out in behavior, I think. Right. Definitely. And, but like, like you said, Melissa, about teaching those routines is so important. And then how, um, you know, all of this has really interfered, right, with all those positive social emotional activities that kids have, but um, they're so resilient too. But you're like, you're completely right too, Lori, that sensory really, sensory processing really does affect um, how social and emotional skills develop. Absolutely. Uh, for, even for us, like, you know, sometimes even breaking down the, um, the child's day, um, just letting, letting the child know if they know, okay, first we're going to do this and then you may do that next. And then oh. having that visual ability to see what we're doing first. And then absolutely you may be able to go, you know, play and sand, or you may even go play with those trucks as soon as we're done doing this, as long as they have that visual as, as to what we're doing first, and then you may go ahead and do that. Or when it comes to centers, things like that, seeing, you know, once that friend is done, then you may go over there and, and be in that location as well. Also too, we've even added the um, visual charts so the children know what they're doing for a whole day. So they know when they go from one activity, when they come in from outside, there's a picture, they know to go ahead and wash their hands and then they move on maybe to the next activity. And some of the children that aren't used to um, getting involved with the routine, then they know that they can move their pictures or move the things along and they can have more of a visual chart to see what is expected uh, next of them. Um, and that way they can kind of correlate the schedule with what they should be doing. Um, you know, over the last two years um, with everything with COVID, a lot of the children, you know, talking with parents and bringing them in as far as um, parents asking, you know, what's expected. Um, a lot of the parents have been working from home. The children, some children never even left their homes. They haven't socialized. They haven't been around other children. They haven't seen other people. So just introducing them back in to finding friends, 
working together, using their words, um, and then being able to, you know, like Melissa said, you know, as far as language and expressing what they need, or just taking a minute to say, you know, if something's bothering them, that's a huge step for them for what they've been through the last, you know, two years. Okay. Um, and then with literacy, um, pretty so with and this information is pretty much coming from a program we use here at our center. And these are the objectives that we use for our preschool and our kindergarten kids and where the we feel like they should be when leaving us and going into kindergarten. And for us too, like we provide the parents um, with um, things that they can see is where the child is at the beginning of the year, the middle of the year and the end of the year. So we're actually working with, with you guys as well as to, you know, where they are and what you guys um, can also work with at home. Um, but with, when it comes to literacy, you know, are you able to knowledge of the alphabet? Do you need to know the whole entire alphabet? No, because even when you're going into kindergarten, it's not, you don't need to know A through Z. That's the things they still need to work on. Um, but that's some things that we do incorporate here. This center does, we do um, how she brought up earlier um, with some centers not working, using the, the alphabet and doing that. That is one thing we, that we kind of do incorporate here and, and when it comes to the alphabet. Um, so just, we, we do um, work on the alphabet here and they do write their letters. We do out the sounds, all the alphabets, making sure they know that. And so we do that um, with them, with them writing and Melody gave some great tools on how to, when it comes to writing the text box, or even for us here, some of us, she brought up the highlighter earlier. Um, we will write the letter and then we'll actually have the, the kiddos use a highlighter, go over top of it to so they, how they kind of get that fine motor of, or the letters of the shapes or even the numbers that we use. Um, and comprehends and response to books and other texts. Um, so like if we're reading a story, we do plenty of stories here throughout our day. Um, the teacher will read them a story and they'll kind of have them interact throughout the stories and actually, you know, ask them characters, you know, what happened. And it's one thing we do here, especially in our play create classrooms, the, the girls will um, write on the, on the boards, on our whiteboards or big paper and take it and kind of make it into their own, into their own stories here as the guides, so they can actually see it from the book and actually see it on paper on the wall as well. Um, and when it comes to the writing skills, so pretty much with us, we're making sure um, when they're, you know, they're writing their letters or they're writing their numbers or their shapes or anything like that. So we're making sure that they're actually holding the pencil correctly or the marker or the crown. And for us, if they actually need some help or assistance, we've actually have reached out to their play with some ideas and them things that we can use um, to, to make a little things easier. When it even comes to scissors, we have gotten some, some grips for these kids to, to use here with some of our kiddos who need to some help, some fine motor skills. So. You know, I just saw um, a question come up as well that I thought this might be a good time to um, interject as far as um, speech milestones. And I don't know, Melissa and Jen, if you have, we actually have a whole chart of milestones for different ages, which um, we can include in the follow up for this. But I don't know if Melissa and Jen, if you have any, you know, um, specific things that you've seen with kids that are struggling with speech that are things that, you know, to be on the lookout for that so that if parents are concerned, they can reach out um, for services, depending on the environment and the age. I know specifically for us here, um, that is one thing like we would definitely make everyone aware of, like if we say anything, and that's one thing that we would talk to the parents about. You know, even if it's saying like, you know, if they're four, do they need to know, you know, the pronounced letter S, you know, there's certain letters like, yes, definitely they don't need to know pronounce quite yet. But that's one thing for us, if we can work on certain things now when it comes to pronouncing um, your letters, let's let's work on that now. And then we would definitely um, talk with both um, both parents and as to what we can do here and as to what their play can do as well, which we reach out to you guys all the time. Yeah, and I think too, like there is like the articulation piece, which is like saying R's, T-H's, S's, and I think you have to be sensitive to where your children are um, versus their peers and getting into kindergarten and first grade, peers are start to be aware of 
either differences between each other and, and specifically we've seen kids that are struggling and then they become acutely aware of the things that they can't do that their friends are doing. So I think it's always always better to err on the side of caution with articulation. Mm -hmm. And then the other things from a parent perspective is if you if your child is you understand everything that they're saying um, inside the house, but maybe the preschool teacher is having a hard time or the kindergarten teacher or their peers are having a hard time. That to me would be a red flag for an evaluation. And then the other two areas is we call it receptive and expressive language. So how is your child able to express? And that goes back to my prior point that other people can understand them, but are they also able to take in what's being communicated to them and process it appropriately? Or are they, are they stumped struggling with that? Um, so those are all areas that if you think your child's struggling in any of them, I would, and I think everybody else on the call would say, err on the side of caution, get an evaluation no matter what age. And we're going to talk about what, you know, what's available um, for evaluations. Um, and, uh, but that would be, and especially I have a, uh, I have three kids that are more grown and, and. I know now <laughs> the areas that I should have like, like, oh, maybe I should check this out earlier and they wouldn't have struggled as much. So um, I, I just saw this, this one chat about the one question about the advice for bilingual children. And interestingly enough, I was just in an evaluation and we talked about this and um, the speech therapist actually said that when it comes to children who are learning two languages, First of all, that's incredible. That's an awesome skill. And, and I'm not sure if Melissa, if you have advice on this, but um, sometimes they do have a little bit of a delayed speech because they're listening to both types of language and they're just learning it. And so it may come out as that way, but um, definitely um, they're, they, you know, studies even shown that kids with two types of languages do incredible so um I, I would definitely can you know continue to provide just exposure to both languages at home and at school or um however the daycare um, preschool it was the advice that i just recently received yeah and i think if they're mastering their um primary language yeah but i think melody right that's and and mm -hmm. actually cognitively from what i've understood from our therapist it's a great thing if they are um, in, in a bilingual, bilingual situation. Um, and sorry, I just saw one question about OT here too. <laughs> sorry, real quick to that. How does OT differ from a teacher when it comes to reading and math? Um, I think the, the way OT differs from, teacher, from a teacher when it comes to reading and math, for example, is that um, teachers really look at um, math and reading concepts. You know, they teach the math and reading concepts. And Melissa, you can chime in if I'm saying this wrong. Um, just, you know, just like what Melissa has right here about the concepts and operations of math and for literacy, the phonological awareness and those word recognition. Whereas OT looks at it more from a physical point of view. Can they write the letters? Can they um, write the numbers? Um, can they line them up? Can they keep them, you know, because sometimes they might know the math, you know, the math concept of adding two plus two, but if two is over here and two is over here, then they're not going to line those up correctly and get the math problem, right? Um, or so OT looks at it from that type of visual mode or perceptual um, component, not as much as the components, which is what the teachers look at. Does that make sense, Melissa? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Got it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, let's go on. I think we've got a lot of questions. So um, we can kind of go through this uh, quickly, I think, and then and then open it up for questions because that's the most um, valuable, I think, for everyone that's on the webinar right now. So, um, yeah, so Melody, do you just want to go briefly over what the educational model sure. and um, I can touch on the medical and developmental? Yeah, so for our educational model, 
um, for a student to qualify for, and I'm going to call them related services, so speech therapy, occupational therapy, physical therapy, those are, um, well, really speech is not, a, I'm sorry, let me back up. Speech is not a, a related service, but in order for a child to receive occupational therapy or physical therapy services in the school, they have to be eligible to have an IEP or an individualized educational program. So um, in a school system, OT and PT services cannot stand alone, um, really, in general. The children qualify for those services based on if they have special education needs. So children can have a speech therapy IEP and then qualify for OT and PT, or they could have a special education IEP and then they could qualify for OT and PT. Um, there's also another way if, if students do have a um, appropriate um, diagnosis, they can uh, qualify for services, um, what they call through a 504 service agreement, which if a child has a um, medical diagnosis or it's not really a medical diagnosis, I'm sorry, a specific diagnosis of um, it could be um, attention deficit, it could disorder, it could be um, cerebral palsy, it could be autism, that they don't have, need special education services, but they have a diagnosis that lends them that they need assistance as well and they're, to access their educational environment. So that's the big key right there. Do kids need services to access their educational environment in order to receive educational services? Yeah, and I think uh, uh, I'll, I'll like start from birth because I'm sure some of you have younger children as well. So just kind of break it down because I feel like I've been with TheraPlay family of companies for 14 years. And this is probably the biggest topic that there's confusion on, on all levels from parents, um, teachers, um, even the medical community. So um, when you look at it uh, from birth to three, there is an opportunity for early intervention which is provided in the, by the counties, depending on which county you live in. And it's, it's considered a developmental model. And what that program provides, it's a phenomenal program. And uh, what they're looking at is developmentally is your child where they should be with their milestones. And if they're not, then we need to provide services that are really it's in the home or the child's natural environment, which is fantastic. And, and they're, it's more of a coaching model for parents, I like to say, like they're, they're there, they're with you, they're with your child, they're looking at what's going on and like, well, how about you hold your baby this way to feed them, et cetera. So it's a developmental model. So that's a, a great program. It's free and it's in the home. And I always say it doesn't get any better than that. And then as Melody was talking about the educational services. So once a child reaches three, then they graduate from early intervention. And then if it's still needed, then they would do an evaluation for the educational model which typically three to five starts in, with the intermediate units in the school district. And then it goes specifically to whatever school district you're in. And as Melody said, that's where they're looking at, can this child access their education? Um, and uh, you know, by themselves, if not, do they need supports? And then an IEP would be developed and all of those kinds of fun things, but it is definitely based on whether they can access their education. In the medical model, which is typically most of your pediatric outpatient facilities, services, I know with our TheraPlay family of companies, they go from birth to 21, which is kind of cool because then you have like a go back to while you're navigating the other services that are available to you. Um, but what we're looking for in that environment is where is this child struggling in their entire life? So maybe they're, they're holding it together in school, but then they get off the bus and they're melting down. Um, yeah. So 
The beauty of it is depending on the state that you're in is that in some states you can access both simultaneously in other states you can access early intervention with medically based services at the same time but I feel like it's nice for us because we can help navigate all of the options because we participate in all of them. And um, in medically based, it's really based on where is the child struggling in their life and can we help them? And then we look to the insurance companies to provide um, the payment for those services. So you have the whole insurance thing um, on the other end of it, but it's three different avenues for supports for your kids and knowing about all of them, I think is, is, is key to helping your child be successful. But I don't think you can give enough to a child that's struggling. And if you can access all of them, depending on the age, all the better for them. And I know I've had talks with Melissa and Jen about this and, and, and and uh, realizing the benefits of the kids that do get um, services in, in the different environments, depending on what they're struggling in. So that's enough. I'll get off my box. <laughs> so, so we tell the parents all the time too, is they have to be their advocate. So if they feel they're not getting the answers and not getting the services yeah. they need, you know, and that's why us, you know, being in the field for a long time, we try to find as many resources we can. That's why we love TheraPlay because you know, we can offer that service to them if they're in school and they need just, you know, services there and they might get an educational uh, diagnosis there, then the medical model, their play, then it's, you know, they have to kind of piece everything together and then see what they need um, and what they feel is the best benefit for their child. So, yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, we have families from Virginia, Delaware, Pennsylvania, New Jersey on the call. So, if you have specific questions, if you want to follow up to this, we can certainly try to help direct you um, as to where you can go for services. So, and what's available. Yes, and I'd just like to remind everyone, um, if you do have a question, go ahead and leave it in the Q&A section or the chat box. Um, I just didn't have uh, the questions pulled up while I was sharing my screen there. So go ahead and ask any question you'd like. And Jason, do you have questions from um, people that sent them in before the webinar? It sounded, it seemed like somebody had suggested that they, they sent in questions. Um, I'm not sure if we got any questions beforehand, um, but again, just drop any questions that you might have uh, into the chat section here. Yeah, that's what we thought we, we better to address any uh, specific questions that everyone had at this point. As I mentioned too, we do have a lot of suggestions that we'll be following up with for you on things to do with your kids. Okay. <laughs> I can see these questions popping up, so. Um, and, and just a, a kind of, a, a, I guess, too, to the point of Wendy, um, we're a family of companies, which I think is really cool because we've got Melody, who's her, her focus and now expertise is in the educational environment. So not only three to five, but five and up. Um, and then we have a whole early intervention team. So if you do have little ones from birth to three, um, we provide services in um, the count in a lot of counties for that as well. And then we really feel, uh, and part of the reason for Jen and Melissa being on this call is that our preschool relationships are so critical because uh, giving um, the you know the kudos to uh, brilliant little minds is like the preschools like are in such a perfect position to identify if a child's struggling. Like you might be at home and, and they might be looking fine, but when they get with their peers, how are they doing? I know all those social emotional types of challenges probably might not come up at home because it's a 
really comfortable environment. And, and I do believe that kids are, it's no different from us. They're smart and they know what they're good at and what they're struggling with at a really young age, just like we do. Like I know what social situations are gonna be comfortable for me and which ones are gonna be awkward for me. They know that, they know playground is no fun for me because I don't know how to navigate it or the Lego table, I just, I can't do that station because I can't navigate my, the fine motor skills are prevent, they don't know that, but they just know the Lego table is difficult for them. Or maybe they have um, some sensory challenges and standing in the line where kids bumping into them is really disruptive to their system and tends to lead them to behaviors just because they wanna get out of it because it's uncomfortable. So I, I think just, just you know, paying attention to the cues of where your kids are um, maybe struggling is, is, is kind of helpful to determine whether you need to seek out extra supports. So Lori, I have um, some really good questions from our audience here. First up, what are some typical procedures, maybe some advice for kiddos with auditory uh, sensitive issues, thinking about fire alarms going off or something like that? Um, I got that one. So yeah, <laughs> let's, let's, let's start there. <laughs> I think that's yours. I was typing as you were uh, talking, as you were talking, but one of the easiest and uh, adaptations you'll see more and more now are just noise canceling headphones for those um, situations. And you can't use them everywhere, right? So a lot of kids are very sensitive to the hand dryers in the bathroom, right? They're so loud, but um, they're, they're so readily available now in kid sizes on Amazon for like $15. They're so nice. They even come in a carrying case so you can put them in the backpack with the kids. Um, sometimes Buses are crazy loud. The um, cafeterias are so loud that, uh, you know, many kids do use that or some teachers will keep them in their classroom in those situations. But that's kind of one of the easiest adaptations to do really quickly and fairly inexpensively. Um, you know, and like I said, Amazon is, is, is my like go-to now <laughs> for a lot of things. I think for everything almost, it seems like. How about um, what services can we offer to a child who is struggling with um, social emotional issues such as emotional regulation, as well as focus and direction following? Well, um, in regards to social emotional, I'd have to rely on the experts of their Melissa for that, but from, um, but for the up, for like the part two of that, for um, direction following and, and focusing, we can use a lot of what we call sensory strategies. Not to say that kids have a sensory, you know, difficulty or processing problem, but sensory strategies work for almost anybody, right? So um, movement breaks are just great. Um, a lot of teachers implement um, brain breaks, they call them now. Um, that you get up and you dance basically for a few minutes and just kind of get your wiggles out and sit back down. Um, fidgets, some of some I've seen all the new pop fidget things they have out. <laughs> they kind of look like reusable bubble wrap. They're kind of awesome. But um, a lot of from from that perspective, that a lot of kids they're they're little, right? And you you can't expect them to come in and be able to sit down for 30 minutes, but giving them starting with small increments seems to work a lot with that as well. Here's another good question. Um, what do you recommend for kids that sensory seek and have ADHD? Uh, how do you get them extra support in school in addition to their IEP? Um, well, the IEP is what does get them any, you know, their support in school. And if you feel like he's not getting enough support, he or she, then um, my recommendation would be to ask for a team meeting um, to see, you know, to get all of your, the therapists and the teachers at least, you know, implementing strategies across um, all classrooms. Because sometimes um, it, I'm, I'm just 
guessing that sometimes kids will go to one classroom for one activity and be okay, but then go to another classroom and not be okay. And so if you can have um, maybe the OT or um, to figure out what is going on differently in different classrooms, a lot of times um, then they can help and figure out some strategies to help them be more successful in the classroom. But I think the first step would be to make sure that um, that the team, your IEP team, which is you and included, know, have a meeting to discuss, you know, those concerns. I'm all about communication. Um, you know, like Lori mentioned earlier, if the child's holding it together and, and then they get home and they melt down, um, that's not necessarily a good thing. So what are some things you can do at school to help, you know, moderate that as well? So I always think communicating with your teachers and your team are the biggest. And I think too, that might be a, a situation where um, getting an evaluation in the medical model might not hurt because one of the, one of the things, things in the medical model is that, um, oh, I feel like, do we hear echo here? I have no idea where that's coming from. Anyway, um, so I do feel like, Jason, help me out here. I don't know what's going on. Um, can you guys all hear me echoing? I think okay. just everyone needed to mute their microphones as well. I think you're good. Oh, okay, cool. So um, I think that um, this might be a situation where the medical model might be of help just because in the medical model, it's one-on-one -on -one for an hour. And if a child's struggling in a particular educational situation, we can't replicate it, but we can try to problem solve. And then as Melody said, communication is so key and then communicate back with either the OT and or the teacher say, you know, here's some strategies we've tried and we really feel like this might be successful. Um, so I, th I think that that could potentially be a help in that type of situation. I agree. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, I was saying that. I had to go on. I had to go on mute myself there. I've got another um, audience question here. If if a child is receiving services for speech special education and OT, is it best to have them do all the services in the classroom or can that impact some of their school curriculum? Should they do some services in school and some outside of school? Hmm. That, that is a tough one. Um, I, guess it, I guess it depends on, um, because I've been in those situations in, in a preschool, and Melissa might be able to speak to this, when you're in a preschool setting sometimes and you only see them for two hours, two and a half hours, two days a week or three days a week, and then they have OT, PT, speech, you know, where is the education happening? Um, but um, I think it's about priorities too. I think it, it's hard to look at what is the priority your priority for for the child like what what are their biggest needs i think and that that is a really tough question to decide what is um but also some schools like push in and and um and that i i i'm very much a be in the classroom model because i think that really helps the students overall and the teachers and the aides learn more about your child as well um, I could actually speak on that just on the personal level too with my son who does receive services for, for speech and some other some other things he also receives. So he does receive his um, services in the classroom. Um, but then I also he does also receive services out, out, of, out of the classroom on our own personal time. I also take my son to TheraPlay and he does receive his um, services in the school district as well. So he does receive both. I don't have um, any other questions, but uh, if there is anybody uh, still out there with a question, go ahead and, and add it uh, while we uh, finish up here. Yeah, and I think I think too to you know Melissa's point and Melody's point and Jen's point earlier. You know, every child's different, and um, trying to figure out what they need. I don't think you know, like I said, um, that you can you know, explore enough. So, you know, maybe an evaluation 
with the school or an evaluation with early intervention if they're under three, an evaluation in the medical model, and then we can kind of figure out and problem solve together um, what makes the most sense for your child. I know we've had some questions that I kind of feel like we'd really love to see your child so that we could put together a specific plan, whether it's educationally based, um, developmentally based or medically based. And, um, and the one other thing I did wanna add and Melody, I don't know if you, you, know, you have anything to add to this, but I do uh, feel like in my years of learning from experts that one of the things that really resonated with me that if you do have a child that's getting services um, in like the educational model, because typically your connection with that is the IEP meetings, is that it's always good to bring somebody else to just listen, maybe take notes because you've got a lot of digesting to do as a parent and um, having that extra person there just to kind of like document for you, uh, tends to be helpful um, to a lot of parents that we've talked to. So um, anyway, uh, that was, that's just my last, I'll throw that out there as like things I've heard over the years as tidbits. And um, do you have, did, did we have one more question there, Jason? I can't wait. I do. Uh, um... We, that is definitely a challenge. I firmly believe that making oh. learning fun helps. Oh, no, nope, oh, that's that you. I'm me. sorry. I'm sorry. I'm reading your, I'm reading your response. No, there are no new questions, Laurie. I'm sorry. Okay. All right. So if anyone else has questions, by all means, we'll, we're going to be following up with you, follow back up with us. If there's other topics that would be helpful, I feel like accessing therapy services is a whole topic on its own. And I, also feel like um, sensory processing challenges, ADD, executive functioning challenges is a whole nother area. We've done um, webinars in the past, but we would certainly be interested in, you know, putting those together, speech and language. And, and I think from Melissa and Jen's point, from a preschool perspective, as a teacher, it's so valuable as well. So by all means, just let us know and we'll follow up with some good information. And then um, we, we appreciate you attending. Uh, yeah, yeah I, we, I really, I personally, and all of, you know, TheraPlay appreciates Melody, Melissa and Jen, your time tonight. Um, we really wanna thank you. Yeah, and that packet will have lots of fun activities to, um, to make things fun. I think somebody asked that. Is it, you know, when you're doing educational services and trying to learn and play based, I think Melissa talked about that, mentioned it earlier. It's like kids just have to play, you know, it's just important for them to play and that's how they learn. So, um, and making it fun. So I hopefully that um, uh, extra activity will have some suggestions on how you can look at some things from uh, fine and gross motor, visual motor activities and give some lots of fun suggestions for some fun activities. Well, thank you everyone. Thanks for your time. We hope this was helpful and um, just keep letting us know what we need to do to help you out. All right, have a good night. All right, night. Mm -hmm.